everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Niche Pursuits podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Hawes from nichepursuits.com. And before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Ezoic. Ezoic is an ad platform that I have been using on my niche site project for site, and I've been very happy with it. Ezoic is a Google award-winning technology that everyone from niche website owners to major brands use to grow and monetize their websites. Ezoic is also a Google certified publishing partner. The platform leverages artificial intelligence to learn from website visitors with the goal of providing more personalized experiences that will improve on-page experiences, which is session length, while also optimizing revenue and monetization on a per visitor basis. The Ezoic platform features everything from intelligent website analytics to advanced automated visitor segmentation tools that allow publishers to improve visitor experiences and increase overall website revenue. Overall, there really are some big benefits to using Ezoic. It's more than just an ad platform, but it truly is a platform that allows publishers to implement sophisticated ad operations and monetization practices on their websites using advanced artificial intelligence. This allows publishers to manage as much or as little as they want. You simply drag and drop ad placeholders and Ezoic will help automatically test thousands of ad partners, ad locations, ad types, and control ad density. This means Ezoic optimizes revenue and engagement for each unique visitor, maximizing the revenue publishers earn. If you want to go and check out Ezoic, you can go to nichepursuits.com slash ezoic. Again, that's nichepursuits.com slash ezoic. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Niche Pursuits podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Hawes from nichepursuits.com, of course. And today I've got Walker Diebel on the podcast. He is an entrepreneur that has made a number of acquisitions and he's the author of the book, Buy Then Build, which I've read and is a great book. You can check it out at buythenbuild.com or you can go over to Amazon and buy it there. He also is a broker over at quietlightbrokerage.com. And like I said, Walker has acquired a number of different businesses. He currently operates a number of different businesses. So he is a broker kind of on the side, if you will. He definitely is an entrepreneur in the trenches, building, buying, selling businesses, and large businesses at that. And so I'm really excited to have him on the podcast. I first came across Walker actually through Jake Kane, who has been on the podcast here in the past. Jake was selling a business through Quiet Light, and Walker worked directly with him. And anyways, Jake just let me know that he was having a great experience with Walker. Then I later ran into Walker at a couple of conferences. So I've met him in person. He's a great guy, stand-up guy that uh, is super smart in the space. So During this interview, we are going to dive into why he thinks acquisition entrepreneurship really is the way to go and why it's so much better than starting a business from scratch. And he shares some examples from his own experience. In addition, we talk about how to use leverage in buying a business, what are some of the things to look for when you're buying a business, and a whole lot more. So if you're interested in buying a business and potentially a seven-figure business, because we are talking usually about larger businesses here, please listen in. I think that you're going to enjoy the interview. Thanks a lot. Hey, Walker, welcome to the Niche Pursuits podcast. Spencer, thank you so much for having me today. Just really thrilled to uh, to have a conversation with you. Been a longtime fan. Awesome. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you. The way we connected is, well, I had heard about you from Jake, Jake Kane. People know about him here on the podcast. And then we ran into each other at Traffic and Conversion Summit. And then, of course, I actually saw your book and I read your book and I just love, of course, what you talk about in regards to acquisition, entrepreneurship, buying sites, and just everything you're doing and your expertise there. So I wanted to have you on and chat about that. A lot of people, this is very possibly the first time they've heard of you. And so can you kind of introduce yourself to the audience here? Give us a brief background of your 
work or business experience before actually buying your first business if you can? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I bought my first company in 2007, late 2007, 2008. And so, uh, prior to that, I was a, um, <laughs> Spencer, right? Like, so I was a, I was an English and religious studies major who then became a stockbroker right out of college. And, and so I was a stockbroker, uh, during the tech bust. And, um, so, nice. so I, I did that for about 11 months and then was laid off with about 6,000 people. And, you know, that's, that's, it's a pretty eye opening experience because you sort of, you know, you like to think about like traditional career paths as being, you know, more, um, secure than entrepreneurship. And I'm telling you on that, you know, kind of black Wednesday, um, you know, I saw grown men with, you know, 20 plus year careers weeping, you know, mm -hmm. and it, it was a pretty eye opening experience. Of course, it, of course, nine 11 happened after that. I, I then was out in California for a while in the Bay area and, um, short stint in LA before moving back to St. Louis to, I went to Washington University in St. Louis to get my MBA. And during that program, I, I did a startup that uh, you know, we can go into this if you want, but, but ultimately, you know, I, we were a finalist in the business plan competition. We had, we had very interested investors. We had a nation, national retailer wanting to roll our product out uh, nationwide. And within about, you know, 24 to 48 hours, the whole thing collapsed. Like the rug was just pulled out from under us all of this promise and um, ambition that we had was, was sort of, you know, immediately removed. And a week later, uh, I graduated and with my MBA and, and then was unemployed, right? There's a very little difference between being an MBA with, with a very promising startup and, and, and graduating without that, and that's unemployed. And that was kind of the moment that I realized, this was 2004, that was the moment that, you know, I realized that entrepreneurs, on, entrepreneurship really wasn't like a it wasn't a necessarily a career path. It's a, it's a bit more of a condition, right? That that's in us. And, you know, my idea was, was sort of just used up. And so I sort of thought, you know, I know there's a way to buy a business. So how do I do it? And I kind of set out on the path and, and, um, nine or 10 months later, still being unemployed, I decided to go corporate. And so I went corporate for, for about a year before ultimately buying my first business and, and resigning from that job. Okay. And we will dive into your first acquisition here a little bit and have a chance to hear about other things that you've done. But I, like I mentioned, I have read your book, Buy Then Build, and I've got it right here. And it, it's excellent. Spencer, I, just, just thank you. I mean, I, I just want to mention it's the, it's the best book that my mother has ever read. So, you know, <laughs> should anyone in the audience be concerned, just know that, it, it, you know, it's got her vote. She's a fan. <laughs> so that's always good to have family members as your fans. <laughs> it's a good start. But throughout the book, you talk about acquisition entrepreneurship. So for the listeners of the podcast, can you explain what acquisition entrepreneurship is? Absolutely. It's really very simple. You know, we all know the concept of growing through acquisition, right? And if you if you really, really dig into the numbers on growing through acquisition, it's actually like the, the safest and fastest way typically to grow, right? I mean, after like the sort of like adolescent phase of, of the land grab in business that, you know, the next thing that happens is, you know, there's always a consolidation. And the reason for that is because it's the fastest way to grow. You know, ultimately, it's we all know of, you know, Internet entrepreneurs. We all know of real estate entrepreneurs. So for me, acquisition entrepreneurship was really the, the, the obvious title. It's, it's simply starting by buying a company first rather than starting a company from scratch. And so why do you recommend this route over starting from scratch? Absolutely. So just look at the data first, right? So first of all, when you start a business, I mean, all of us that, that have done that know how incredibly hard it is, right? Like, like, uh, like starting, starting from scratch is ultimately, it can be punishment for people that just don't understand statistics, right? So in other words, you've got, you know, we all know the sort of rule of thumb that, you know, nine out of 10 entrepreneurs kind of succeed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, what's, what's, what's behind the curtain that we don't actually realize is that 96% of the ones that succeed never actually ever surpass a million dollars in annual revenue. Okay. So although a, a website or a content site, you know, you know, you can, you can make a significant amount of earnings doing something like that. But for most entrepreneurs who are trying to build something, you know, of, of, of a big size or, you know, that, you know, all these moonshots, for example, like something that's going to change the world or all the rest of it, you know, the, the, the reality is that very few of them succeed. In fact, 75% of startups that receive venture capital, which on average is like $41 million, 75% of them go to zero. Okay. Wow. 
And the 25 that make it are, are starting to exit close, you know, sooner and sooner. And the more you look at VC, it's kind of like a, the VCs win, not the entrepreneurs, not by and large, right? So buying an existing business provides, you know, an existing customer base. It provides product market fit. It provides cash flow. It provides, you know, infrastructure in terms of whatever is needed to sort of generate, you know, the value. And then moreover, they're bankable. So, you know, you get to go to the bank and just say, hey, give me a loan so I can buy this business. And because of recent trends in the SBA, they're lending up to 90 percent. So it's one of these where, you know, if if access to capital is your objection, it's it's effectively removed. Like you just need to find 10 percent of the company you want to acquire. And so, Spencer, just to bring that around, if you were to acquire one of the largest four percent of companies in the United States, you really could do it for for less than 100,000 in cash, which is not out of line in terms of what the average startup takes anyway in, in seed capital. Right. So it's just about getting on base. Right. I've called it entre metrics in the past. Like, you know, a play on saber metrics. You know, it's just sort of like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, rather than shooting for the home runs, how do you get on base? And acquisition entrepreneurship is really that path. Yeah, it's really fascinating. And you lay it out pretty well in terms of, you know, if you're going to try and start something from scratch, we all kind of know the statistics there. Um, what I really was fascinated about and that you just mentioned that I did, was not aware of is that 96% of companies do not even never make it over that a million dollar a year mark. And so if you're trying to hit that, why not just, you know, buy? And so as you explained quite well there, but speaking of our time right now, you know, 2019, at the end of 2019, why is now a great opportunity to buy a business compared to maybe 10 years ago? Sure. Great question. Okay. So t there's really two reasons. I mean, one is the, is the sort of reason I mentioned regarding the recent trends in SBA. So there's more capital, like there's an ease, like capital is, is no longer the bottleneck. It's very simple to get capital. It's there. There's $1.2 trillion in liquid cash in PE firms. And the SBA is, is, um, is lending for, for even cash flow loans, which they were not doing, uh, even, even in 2008. So it's, it's very recent, but then the biggest reason Spencer is that, you know, not only right now, but also for the next decade to, you know, 12 years out, we have the single largest transfer of wealth in history. In other words, the baby boomers own more companies than any generation in the history of mankind. OK. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that there's there's an estimated 10 trillion dollars in business value that needs to change hands. Right now, the real opportunity for me is not only are all of these companies bankable, but the thing is, is like I'm, I'm going to go a little deep here. But, but the thing is, is that for me, if you really look at the ultimate business strategy, you know, the thing that's really creating lasting value today is sort of an intersection of old economy with new economy. OK, let me make let me give you an example. Okay. You know, if you walk down the street and ask 10 people, like, what's Amazon, right? All 10 will tell you it's an e-commerce site. It's really not. It's, it's a network of warehouses. And all they do is, you know, essentially like inventory management and fulfillment. Okay. You look at Tesla and you're talking about a car company. It's a car company, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you look at, you know, you look at like, so, so like, you know, Harry's razors or something like this. I mean, it's, you know, they, they bought a German razor blade manufacturing company because it's it's really difficult to make really good razors but then they use their their e-commerce skill set in order to you know create an online subscription business right apple i mean that's probably the, the the most valuable company ever in history and you know they're really the only i don't know what you want to call them software or computer company they're the only one that really tackles both so you know the intersection of these two business models is really the thing for except uber right i mean it, you know it's an app with automobiles. It's a taxi company for crying out loud, right. right? But it's bringing innovation to all of these things. And so the thing is, is when the baby boomers were creating their business, when they were getting that product market fit, it was in a time that does not compare to today. Okay. And you get a lot of, forgive the expression, but you get a lot of like gray haired fat cats that, you know, they aren't really wanting to take risk anymore. They're just sort of running these lifestyle businesses, whether that be you know, I'm making 250,000 a year or I'm making, you know, 25 million a year. I, you know, I mean, it's still a lifestyle business to, to a, a big extent. And so the thing is, is like being able to acquire these companies and then use the cash flow to sort of fund your innovation, right, is the thing that I think that can really take take entrepreneurs to the next level by, you know, piggybacking off of the infrastructure that's already there. 
Yeah, that's that's awesome. And hopefully that's kind of a light bulb for a lot of people, because I think that makes a lot of sense. And maybe you can explain how you've done that a little bit through either your first acquisition or a recent acquisition company that that you purchased and sort of brought innovation and either technology or sort of the online skill set or, or something similar uh, to one of your businesses. Sure. Let, let me give you two examples. Just stop me if I'm talking too long. But basically, the first company I bought was a book printing company. OK. Mm-hmm. And there's a couple reasons I did it. But the big reason I did it was actually because if you looked at what's called digital book printing, which is not ebooks, it's actually like, you know, short run book printing on like exalted Xerox machines. Right. It was it was actually growing at like 30 to 38 percent year over year for four years prior. OK. So there was a big trend happening in the industry. And going right back to that image of like the gray haired fat cats, like like that's who owned, you know, book printing companies in, in you know, the late 2000s. Right. Mm-hmm. So a whole bunch of, of people, owners like complaining that it wasn't the 1990s. And yet like the, like there's this huge growth trend right under their feet. So I bought this company and, you know, we were doing, I don't know, eight million in revenue. And, you know, it's about 50,000 square feet and, you know, et cetera. And I bought the company ultimately with with a seller note and a big ass bank loan. Right. And. I went in and, and just sort of knocked down the walls and, and used the cash flow to build out a digital book printing facility. And then I turned around and sold it to the existing customer base. And, you know, within, I don't know, within about 18 months, it was over 20 percent of revenue, which, you know, that's that's big growth in that industry. Yeah. Right. And then and then, you know, also, I want you to consider this was also when, you know, right there in like 2008 was right when the iPad came out. So ebooks were making headlines, you know, the iPad was cranking, you know, and and everyone thought that I was absolutely crazy, you know, to go into this sort of like mature industry. But but really what I saw was opportunity. Spencer, I then I then just realized like, you know, I sort of hit a ceiling and I realized that, you know, I needed this sort of like infrastructure to better sell to like, let's call them digital publishers. OK. Mm-hmm. And because, you know, we sort of had this like kind of old school, you know, approach to to B2B sales, et cetera. And the publishers we worked with, but you know, it was going to cost me a million dollars for like this advanced, you know, IT infrastructure I wanted to build. And the promise of you know customers was effectively zero, right? Plus, I didn't have a million dollars. I don't know about you, but you know, I, I didn't have it, right? And if I did, I wasn't just going to pump it into some dream, right? So it was one of these like I knew from what I knew about multiples in that industry, multiples meaning valuations of those companies. I knew that I could, if I found the right company, I could acquire that infrastructure so much less expensive. And with cash flow and with customers. So I went on like a two and a half year acquisition effort that ended up finding the perfect company for this. You know, I was in St. Louis, they were in Chicago and and they had two different locations or about 10,000 square feet. And they did only digital book printing after about four months of discussions. They, they weren't for sale or anything. This was just sort of like proprietary outreach. They, did, they were like, Walker, we love your vision. We've got to do it. I was like, great. They're like, we just want to change one thing. I'm like, yeah, what is it? And they're like, we want to buy you. <laughs> <laughs> and I was 35 years old in the book printing industry. So I was like, that's not a problem, right? Like, like you know, the, the thing that was important to me was, you know, all of my employees, you know, maintained employment mm-hmm. at, you know, fair equivalent rates, which, which, which happened. So it was, so I also got my exit through practicing yeah. entrepreneurship. Yeah, so that's a story. But I, if I can keep going, I'd love to tell another Absolutely. one. Absolutely. Yeah, please do. Sure? Okay, I don't want to dump. So, so, okay. So basically, I, w- I want to go back to right. Actually, it leads right into this. Right after I had my first exit, it, it wasn't enough to retire, but it was like, you know, I made enough money to sort of go do something cool. Right. Mm-hmm. And it was one of these where I was like, all right, I'm going to do, you know, what everyone does, which is I'm going to go start a a SaaS business for the enterprise. <laughs> and uh, me and, and a few people sort of uh, jumped on this technology that was sort of coming out of a, a local company here in St. Louis and said, hey, we want to start a company around this and et cetera. So we did. And we started this company. We recruited a Microsoft executive to be our CEO. We, you know, we did a capital raise. You know, we went through one of the top 10 accelerator programs in the world. You know, our capital raise was oversubscribed. We had beta programs in like half a dozen very large companies, right? Like all of the things that that sort of, you know, reflect like, OK, this one's going. Mm-hmm. And about 14 months later, 16 months later, we were we were completely out of cash. And, you know, I'm leading like a reorg in a company with like three employees, you know, wow. <laughs> and, and uh, it was just one of these like, you know, 
So the broker that I worked with for two and a half years called me and said, Walker, how's that startup going? And I was like, oh, it's it's on the rocks. And he said, good. There's this business. <laughs> you've got to see it. And I'm like, oh, brother, you're kidding me. And, you know, of course, that's 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 a really good example of, you know, once you get deal flow, like the deals kind of start coming to you. Right. But anyway, right. so, they, you know, he I went and saw the business and ultimately I did end up buying it. And it really was um, a B2B fulfillment company. OK. And I used the cash flow. We, I had, a, I had a partner in this one. We used the cash flow of the of the business to build out in a proprietary e-commerce storefront that we then turned around and rolled out into twenty thousand different locations, right? Like uh, users. Okay, so you know twenty thousand logins within nine months. Wow. And so that's that's when it occurred to me, everything that we were trying to achieve at this, you know, that at this like rocket ship startup, this like sexy SaaS business. I was actually able to accomplish by buying this, you know, like unsophisticated, you know, B2B fulfillment company in a very unassuming city in the middle of Missouri. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, and so, and so that's when, and, and I did it with a bank loan, right. As opposed to, you know, raising a bunch of capital and giving away a bunch of equity. So, uh, as, as luck would have it, I owned that company for about four and a half years and, and actually sold it on Monday one week ago. Oh, really? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. So technically that'd be my my um my third exit to date, which is fun. Yeah, that is very exciting and I do want to hear just a little bit more about what you're involved in right now and then I have a couple other questions as well, but uh, can you give us a sense of your overall portfolio of companies that you're currently involved with? Sure. So, you know, over let's see, over 11 years I bought seven companies outright. Some of those were merged together, some of them were sold off, you know, etc. But basically, where I am today is I own a a manufacturing facility in the middle of Missouri that does, you know, um aluminum welded uh railing and fencing and you know, it's it's welded, it's custom built, it's powder coated. It's it's an absolutely awesome product, but it's it's hardcore manufacturing, Spencer, yeah. right? But then I also have uh, three websites that I run. I sell um, up flush toilets online. I sell uh, bidet toilet seats online. Mm. Um, and then, of course, I've got the whole buy, then, build thing, uh, mm -hmm. which is, you know, um, the, I've got a book and, you know, I'm, I'm building out a, um, an extensive online course and, and all of that stuff. And then I work with Quiet Light Brokerage as a broker for online businesses. But then in terms of like minority holdings, you know, I'd be amiss, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that I'm also a film producer. I don't know if, I don't know if you have uncovered that all, but, but I've got uh, about. I'm aware, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so I've made about, um, I've made about um, 10 or a dozen films where, you know, we sort of develop them and then send them to, sell them to distributors and streamers. So I've got about three projects I'm kind of working on in the background right now. I own a minority interest in a early childcare, high quality, early um, high quality child care facility um, in Kansas City. We work to about five locations. Um, I'm, a, I'm a, a founding partner in, in CodeSmith, which is an intensive coding academy on LA and New York. And let's see what else. I feel like there's something else I'm missing, but you know, that's, that's <laughs> probably 80% of what's on my plate right now. So you've got a ton of projects. I mean, how do you find time to run a manufacturing company, a, you know, uh, and all these other businesses that you have? I mean, how do you find the time to do all that? I mean, Spencer, I wrote by then build because it was the book I needed in 2004 when I was trying to do this. Right. Mm -hmm. And and ultimately, you know, I was trying to figure out I was trying to I was like, this is happening. And all these entrepreneurs are like, you know, we're all burning all of our fuel, uh, you know, trying to start something from scratch. Right. Like it's it's that it's that analogy where, you know, the rocket takes whatever it is, like 95 percent of the fuel to get out of orbit. And then it's basically five percent of the fuel to like go all the way to the moon and back. You know what I mean? Like so we're burning all this fuel and like it's it can, there's a better path for most people. Right. And so once I started, you know, I try to use other people and interviewing other people as the groundwork for kind of building that book. And, you know, I wasted probably a couple of years doing it. Like, like I even brought in a, a PhD and hired him for the summer to help me synthesize the data that, that I was finding both through interviews and research. And ultimately, by the end of that, we just sort of figured out like everything is sort of anecdotal and specific and just sort of like out, you know, you know, on the perimeter. And so I spent a lot of time really trying to identify how I looked at businesses and how I tried to navigate the process and how it was that, that, you know, I've ultimately found success after a lot of really hard work and wasted time. And I, and so the reason I bring that up here is because I was really sort of defi it took me four and a half years to write by then build. And the thing is, is that during that time I was really kind of 
you know, I, I did <laughs> to be clear, I didn't invent buying businesses, right? I mean, that's been around <laughs> forever. But but right. it, you know, Chuck Mullins joked with me about that recently. But it, but anyway, it's, it's <laughs> like by by sort of like um, you know building frameworks around acquisition entrepreneurship, I really started to define the model in my own brain. Okay, and then and then I sort of started going into how would you scale acquisition entrepreneurship beyond you know buying one company and sort of running it, right? And, you know, I mean, we all know, we all know Shaquille at, you know, ProClick, right? And so it's, yep. it's, a, it's a lot of it is a similar model. Like basically I buy companies, but I buy them more often than not with CEOs in mind. Okay. Um, and so I go in there and, um, and I'll buy a company and basically put, put a, a manager in place, a general manager in place or a president, whatever your term is mm-hmm. CEO. And I, I tend to act more as a chairman but I don't call myself that because, you know, I don't have enough gray hair. So, <laughs> but, you know, I sort of work on, on, you know, a weekly or a monthly cycle with, with, uh, most of the team. But that being said, I mean, you know, I completely run all three of my websites. Like, you know, no one, no one else is running that kind of stuff. Okay. So very good. You're using a lot of other people, of course, to, um, yeah, run, run the core uh, company or, uh, even the websites you run. I'm sure you've got a lot of processes in place that, that make things a little bit easier. And well, certainly an online business is a little bit easier. There's a lot less people to manage and, and be involved there. So you've purchased manufacturing, distribution, and other offline companies. Do you recommend that others buy these sort of offline businesses or are online businesses the way to go? Sure. I, I love online businesses. It's probably where my skill set thrives. Um, I also think for most people, it's probably an easier thing to tackle. Let me explain why. I mean, one of the reasons, you know, one of the reasons I joined Quiet Light was, you know, it was one of these where I bought a company and, and, uh, you know, the broker at the end was like, wow, you, you really understand this. Like you should be a broker. And I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but Just kidding. But, but not really. And then I had a broker who I bought a business and then he decided to try to sell me his entire brokerage. Like he believed that I was his succession plan. Right. And I was <laughs> like, you know, and then I went and became a certified M&A advisor and sort of had like all these like middle market, like I'm talking like 50 to hundred million dollar transactions trying to recruit me. And it was like, you know, if I ever did this, you know, I really would only focus on online businesses. And um, I guess this is a plug for Quiet Light. I, I, I didn't want to go that way, but but I loved Quiet Light as a buyer, like raving fan, right? Yeah. And so it's one of these where with online businesses, there's a few advantages. Number one, when it's time for you to exit, the buyer pool is global, right? So, you know, I recently sold a company in Springfield, Missouri. Okay. So I needed someone within, I don't know, a 50 mile square radius of right. spring, Missouri, um, you know, and that's, that's, so it shrinks your buyer pool. So your buyer pool is bigger. Number two, there's tons of third party verification. So, you know, if I get a potential seller who doesn't use Google analytics, it's sort of like, you know, get out of here. Right. I mean, you know, there's so much mm-hmm. data in terms that, that can be validated by other people. And then third, it's very, very, very quantifiable, right? Like you don't like it. Let's say you're buying like a, a cafe. All right. Like you have no idea how many people were in this cafe like, you know, on this date last year between the hours of like one and three. Right. Online businesses, you have all that data. You know, you know what your customer acquisition cost is. You know what your what your traffic is. You know, I mean, there's so much data that you have to look at to quantify the decision. And and the last thing is probably the best, which is workloads tend to be lighter and there's fewer employees. And I mean that as a benefit in terms of if it's your first time buying a business or your first time running a business, you know, employees add a exponential amount of complexity to to a day job. Right. And, you know, just simply trying to manage, you know, expectations and emotions and, you know, people that that leave you or, you know, people that want promotions that don't get them or vacation schedules with, you know, you were going to Florida, but now you're not because someone, you know, just all the rest of it. And so, um, you know, I've got I've got partners that sort of refer to online businesses as management light. Right. I don't know that that's entirely true, Spencer. And you and I know that there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of really hard work that goes into online businesses, right. but, but you are able to remove a lot of complexity that can kind of pull you off task, which I really love. Yep. So I'm, I'm sorry, let me pull that around. So your question was, you know, what businesses should people be buying? Mm-hmm. And the thing is, you know, if you read buy, then build, it's not a go buy an online business book, right? It's right. here's how to buy an online business. And, and what I really encourage people to do is don't run out and look at what's on the menu until you truly go inside and look at yourself 
and understand what is it that I bring to the table as a CEO? Because when you look at a business, that business is not going to exist like it does today after you close. It's going to be you plus the business. So what do you bring to the table, right? Yep. And not, and not only that, but but you know, I want you to match your skill set with the growth opportunity that a business has. And so that might be online, it might be offline, but you know, ultimately, you just need to follow that framework in terms of what are you good at. If you're good at managing people, you know, running, you know, efficient operations, running a, a manufacturing facility, that that's where you need to go. On on the flip side, Spencer, if you were to go out and buy 12 companies, obviously you should be buying, you know, niche websites that are that are content where the content, you know, maybe 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 they've got a bunch of, you know, PPC and um and very very um historically proven, you know, paid ads, but like you know, there's a huge growth opportunity on the content generation side. Right. I'm, I might be wrong. I'm just sort of making that. Sure. Big, right. Yeah. How can I apply my expertise? Yep. Yes. Absolutely. No, that, that makes sense. And I mean, obviously, you're a fan of buying businesses and believe that acquisition entrepreneurship is a great route for many other people. But is there a type of person that should not be looking into buying a business? I mean, who is this not a good fit for? Great question. You know, like when I give talks... I'll, I'll often start with, you know, you know, what, like, why are you guys here? Like, what questions do you have? Right. And, and inevitably, I get someone who stands up and says, like, I'm closing tomorrow. What do I do? I'm like, all right, <laughs> we'll get to you later. And then I also get someone on the other side of the bell curve that always says, like, how do I even know? Right. Like, if this is right for me, you know, how do I know if I can do it? Right. And so the thing is, is I, I want to whittle down, you know, what makes a successful entrepreneur? OK. And, and ultimately, if you take all the psychology and all the research and everything that, that will ultimately tell you, you know, like, like if you're a successful entrepreneur, it's, it, it really boils down to this. It's a intelligent individual committed to a good opportunity. OK, mm -hmm. so in other, in other words, it's not a great opportunity. It's a good opportunity, but it's the level of commitment of that individual. Right. That is going to, you know, make it work or not. And when you're an entrepreneur, and Spencer, you know this firsthand, you are living the most engaged life possible, right? Like, you don't have a steady income per se, right? It's, it's you know, it, it comes in, in ebbs and flows, right? Yep. I mean, it's not a lot to hang your hat on. It's sort of, you know, there's no, there's no, you know, there's no work-life balance, in my opinion. It's all the same. You're just, you're living your work, right? It's just what you love to do. You're engaged in what's happening. And so the thing is, is like, number one, you've got to be comfortable with that. Number two, there's a lot of risk in entrepreneurship. Now, there's a lot of risk in being a, you know, a stockbroker for one of the largest, you know, financial institutions in the world, too, because mm -hmm. I was laid off. Yeah. But, but, you know, you've got, you know, a lot of people, they'll go raise capital and they call themselves entrepreneurs. But I want you to really think about this for a minute. These are a lot of times these are people that they don't have any of their own capital at stake and they're making a salary. So what is that really? Yeah. It's an employee. I don't know. I mean, you know, I mean, got <laughs> idea, but you know, I'm not going to, but you know, the point is, is that, you know, when you practice acquisition entrepreneurship, you're always kind of your own capital at stake. And moreover, you're also going to go take a loan. And if you choose, like the biggest criticism I get is like that, that, you know, I encourage people to go load up on all this debt. I don't. Okay. I don't. The thing is, is that if that's your objection, it's there. And if you do that and it works out, it's actually the greatest ROI return on investment of any investment period. OK, but it makes cash flow really tight. So you better make sure that you're going to be able to jump in and grow that business. See what I'm saying? Right. You know, otherwise, cash flow is tight. You're focusing on equity buildup and, and all the rest of it. So if you've got income coming from somewhere else or whatever, I mean, look at private equity. They've collapsed like twice. And so what they do now is they take, you know, they put about about 40 to 50 percent in equity down to just sort of increase the margin of safety, but they, they reduce their ROI by doing that. So if you are driven and committed to the cause and you are comfortable, you know, taking on a certain amount of debt to, to invest in yourself and your, in your activity, I think that's when you know. Yep. No, that's good. I think that uh, can help people think through their own particular situation and decide, of course, if buying a business is right for them. I do want to ask you just a little bit about looking for a business to buy in terms of, you know, what do you look for? So let's imagine you were looking for another online business uh, to buy. What are some positive things or just other things that you would recommend people look for when trying to buy that business? Okay. An online business? Yes. Um, 
Okay. Well, yeah. First of all, it, you want to identify the, the business risks. Okay. So in other words, it's not about eliminating risk because there's no such thing. Okay. You just need to be able to identify what they are and feel comfortable in your ability to sort of navigate them or, you know, avoid them. Okay. Let me give you an example. Like, so, so if you take, think of it, think of, there's a recent trend that I've seen and that's like, you know, even as recently as 18 to 24 months ago, people were just not willing to buy Amazon businesses. They were like, why would I buy an Amazon based business? Like Amazon has all the power, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas today, uh, people look at that and say, oh, Amazon is a totally viable channel. And by the way, it's so crowded that now I'm looking for, you know, businesses that have, you know, whatever, a thousand reviews and really good organic rankings and, you know, a minimum of 24 months of history. Okay. Right. That's a good business. But Amazon holds all the cards. So, you know, you need to you need to identify those risks and just be able to say, like, all right, I'm going to I'm going to either capitalize on that or I'm going to, you know, diversify off of Amazon or whatever it is you want to do. But you need to be able to identify what the risks are and, and, and navigate it. Second, uh, look for growth opportunities. So really understand, you know, how it is that you're going to grow the business and the path that that um, that you can go there. Third is is really just uh, transferability of the business. You want to make sure that, you know, the owner doesn't have some kind of special skill set. Um, I once I think it's OK to share this. I once had a um, I'll keep it vague. Uh, I once had a person who had a solar panel business. He sold solar panels to companies. Right. Mm -hmm. But he had I'm trying to be vague. He had a really advanced knowledge of the technology. OK. And as a result, he was able to actually sell these companies. And so it was, you know, sort of like really hard to to duplicate, really hard to transfer. You with me? Like, right. It's kind, of like, it's kind of like if a medical doctor was trying to, you know, um, sell his business. But then you had to step in and be the medical doctor. Like if you're not an M.D., it, you can't buy it. Right. right. Like, so yeah. You, just, you can't just step in and assume that role. Yeah. Right. Understand what's leaving with 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 the with the entrepreneur and and understand that you know you're going to need to take over that skill set. So just understand that transferability. Look for those you know document SOPs and all the rest of it. But then the third is really just it's documentation. I mean you know do, you know can you trust what's there? Like you know what third party verification do you have? Like you know are they using QuickBooks or some kind of accounting software where you've got clean financials? You know what other sort of you know documentation is is there to support it and just really look to trust but verify what it is that you're acquiring. Those, I mean, those are really the four things. And, and after that, I mean, you know, as long as you're, I mean, some people believe the, the, you know, real estate adage that, you know, you make money when you buy, not when you sell. The marketplace is kind of the market. I mean, there's sort of like a, a price that goes on, on businesses at any certain time. So um, as long as I'm paying fair market, you know, I don't really try to time the market because you can, I mean, let me say it like this in 2013, I didn't know why the stock market was going up. Right. So mm -hmm. so I actually went and bought more companies rather than private companies rather than, you know, investing more cash in the stock market. And, you know, I, it's worked out for me to date. But like, look at the stock market. I mean, it's it, you know, I tried to time the market. and You just can't. So I don't know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you learn not to time the market. So but, you know, figure out where you end up on on price and understand that, you know, historical growth and earnings really are the fundamental drivers of value. And then just kind of look for those four things. Yeah. Great tips. I've got this question uh, from other people in the past. And in fact, over the weekend, we were both at a business conference and I got this question again, is a lot of people are wondering, you know, should I buy a, a really small, if I've never, if, if I don't have a lot of an exper experience as an entrepreneur building an online business, should I buy something small? Let's say, you know, they've got, you know, buy a, a site that's making a thousand dollars a month or a couple thousand dollars a month just to kind of get their feet wet and learn. And then down the road, once they feel like they've you know, made their mistakes on the small website than by a larger site? Or would you recommend people jump right in and buy a larger business, get an SBA loan, right? Maybe they can get a seven figure business. So what are your thoughts on that? It's the ultimate question. What a great question. I, you know, so it's one of those things where it's going to be different for everybody, but okay. So the thing is, is like, if, you know, if you buy a website doing a thousand dollars a month, in earnings. Mm -hmm. What I'm going to tell you is, you know, I've looked at a lot of deals. Okay. I mean, you know, thousands and I've seen companies with 15 million in revenue that don't make a thousand dollars a month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know? So the thing is, is like, 
making sure that that cash flow is there is is number one. Yeah. Number two, if I'm going, this is subjective, but if I'm buying offline, I definitely try to buy at least a million in revenue. Okay. I even try to buy at least a million in gross margin. Okay. In the world of business, a million in revenue is is small. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just that the vast numbers are that, you know, 96% of companies aren't there. So the thing is, is, is there's a, there's an extra level of security in my opinion or product market fit with companies that are able to achieve that million dollar in revenue mark. Right. What I've noticed is that, you know, in online businesses, you can get the same level of discretionary earnings, you know, or net income on an on, on a smaller online business, especially a content business than, you know, a very large offline business. So, you know, for me, I, I prefer to define in terms of earnings. Because I think that a lot of times people, so for the, the 23 year old that's looking to cut their teeth, I mean, obviously I would never encourage them to run out and, you know, buy a $5 million company. Uh, for someone who is, you know, a middle manager at a large organization who is, you know, maybe a little more sophisticated, a little bit more sure of their abilities. And, you know, let's just say they're, you know, 50 years old. It's a different profile, right? Yep. And, you know, if they're jumping out of a company making, you know, that's, that's generating, you know, 40 million a year. I mean, buying a company that's doing a million dollars a year is tiny for them. And not only that, but they're definitely going to need that kind of cash flow in order to, you know, transfer their, their lifestyle and, and their, their salary. Um, so it's one of those where I like that strategy. Um, but ultimately you really just need to figure out like, do I want to buy that, that million dollar in revenue company that has that added benefit of being one of the largest 4% of companies in, in the country or, you know, do I still need some training? And I, and I, you know, and I, the only thing I'd caution against is, is I see a lot of people start with, Hey, I'm going to buy a bunch of small businesses. And the only thing I would caution against is that it sounds like a really good idea at the beginning. Right. And what I see over and over again is like, all of a sudden now you've got someone with like 24 different websites or, you know, even way less than that. And they can't manage them all. And they start to get, they start to lose passion for like those first three, you know what I mean? And so they don't necessarily, it's not interesting enough for them to invest their time in it because the dollars are so small. So it's something that I feel like it's kind of like when you, when you donate to a charity and they're like, just donate an amount that's meaningful to you. I would say buy a company that has a cash flow that's meaningful to you and just kind of stick with it, you know, rather than trying to scale quickly. Yeah. Great. Anyway, I'm sorry, scale quickly. I'm, I'm sorry. I just want to clarify. I, ju- I just mean, don't run out with and buy multiple businesses until, until you've got one that, you know, you're able to work on and commit to. Right. Yep. I think that makes a lot of sense. I appreciate you coming on the podcast here, Walker. I just have uh, one more question for you. If people want to learn more from you regarding acquisition entrepreneurship, where should they go? That's your last question. That's an easy one. That, yeah. <laughs> so, I, you know, all I would say is I've got a, I've got a ton of free resources on, on buy then build.com. I really try to uh, put a lot of time into putting together a bunch of valuable stuff there. So a bunch of free stuff there, videos on, you know, the four ways to add value to an acquisition and all that kind of good stuff. Awesome. Yeah. If people want to go to buy then uh, they can do that to learn a little bit more uh, from Walker here, but overall Walker, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Appreciate your time. I feel like we could probably talk for hours. I mean, diving into each of your businesses and strategies and so much more, but I, hopefully we've given oh, no. people a good overview of, you know, buying a business in general. I hope so too. Thanks so much. And if we talk for another hour, I'm turning the tables. I'm, I, we're, we're going to unpack <laughs> Mr. Haas and, and the enigma that is your brain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good luck with that. See if you can figure me out. Um, <laughs> no, very good. Walker again. Appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks Spencer. Thank you once again for listening to the Niche Pursuits podcast. As a reminder, this episode has been sponsored by Ezoic. Ezoic is a Google award-winning technology that everyone from niche website owners to major brands use to grow and monetize their websites. Ezoic is a Google certified publishing partner. It's a platform that leverages artificial intelligence to help you optimize revenue and monetization on a per visitor basis and so much more. If you want to check out Ezoic, go to nichepursuits.com slash Ezoic. Again, that's nichepursuits.com slash Ezoic. Thanks a lot.